welcome back to the channel where it's having a great day today. So currently outside in the garage because today's video revolves around the truck again. I know you guys seem to really like the truck content. Obviously that's what this channel is based around. So obviously I'm not gonna forgo that from you guys. So today's video, we're actually doing something kind of interesting to me. You guys know I like to do these kind of topics videos once in a while on these trucks, which is always kind of fun to talk about always. Uh, just neat little sport track related topics. So first thing I wanna say right away, if you guys saw last Friday's video where I was talking about opening a community page, the Roast Tire subreddit is officially up. I originally wasn't planning on tying my name to anything, but after talking to people, um, I decided it was best to be more inclusive and then just sport tracks. Not the, the entire audience doesn't all drive sport tracks. Plenty of people drive Mustangs, Camaros, everything. I've, got, I've literally heard from subscribers who have different cars than I do, and therefore I'm not gonna make it a sport track only thing. So we're gonna do a subreddit, which is already up, and then eventually a Facebook community page as well to go alongside it. Um, but I'm working on the logistics and how I wanna set that up here later on. But for now, let's get on with the rest of this video, which is going to be the common problems with the sport track and what to do about it. And this will help people who are new deciding whether they wanna buy a sport track in general, or people who already own them and know what to look out for. So today we're gonna to start off with mine. So this is only gonna cover the 01 to 05s, which is what I have, I have an 03. And uh, if you guys don't know, new to the channel, this is my 03 full bolt on low work truck. And uh, we're gonna talk about some of the issues that plague these things. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about maintenance things. So don't expect to see wheel bearings or suspension components that wear out because as trucks age, it's what happens. As cars in general age, it's, that's what happens. So we're gonna talk about more of the things that Ford themselves designed and screwed up on with this truck uh, that causes them to fail prematurely. And there's actually quite a bit with the Gen 1, it um, appears the Gen 2s appear to have a bit more issues, uh, more with electronics um, than mechanical failures like what these Gen 1s have. The Gen 1s have quite a few mechanical issues while the Gen 2s have more electronic issues. So we're going to start off with that here in a moment, but I'm going to go ahead and get set up in my chair, with my trap pod, get all comfy, and we're going to get right into this. So let's get the elephant out of the room right away, and that is all the flaws of the 4.0. Now there's actually not too many, but I would say the 4.0 is far from a perfect engine. It's got horrible fuel economy, it's got a large displacement and low power ratio, if you could say that displacement and power ratio if that exists, I don't know, I'm just pointing that out. I mean, it's, most four liter engines are producing a lot more power than 210 crank, brand new. And obviously people are gonna say that I'm wrong, that the 4.0 is this excellent engine, but I very, 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 very strongly disagree in that it's fine, but it's flawed, uh, as most engines are. No engine is 100% perfection, and is this this whole just holy grail of an engine and the 4.0 is no different. The 4.0 is plagued with probably the biggest issue that I've ever seen on any Ford engine and that is timing chain failures because the single cam 4.0 really had weak timing chain setups and the worst part about it is that the passenger side cam uh, is pretty much reversed. The timing chain sprocket is on the back of the engine on the passenger side meaning lots of things. Doing it yourself is nearly impossible unless you have the right tools uh, taking it to a shop, most people won't do it because of how hard it is to do it. Uh, they'll rather just replace the engine because it costs about the same, they say. Um, which is obviously untrue because timing chains are, like pulling the engine doing the chains would probably be a lot easier and cheaper than it would be to replace the engine. But most shops just will just say right out, do that. And as a jack shaft that controls the whole thing from the uh, driver's side cam, which is on the front, as it should be. Um, but it could be worse. You could have the Audi 4.2 V8 and have all four of them on the back. Um, I love those cars, I love the 4.2s, but that is, uh, that's quite a uh, mishap right there of that setup. But the 4.0 has its timing chain on the rear on the passenger side cam, uh, which is a really poor design choice and of course means a lot higher expenses to replace it, especially on a part that is meant to be replaced fairly often on a high mileage vehicle. If you drive a car for a very long time, you know, it's stuff that you're gonna have to take into account to replace. The Kia Spectre right here next to me, probably doesn't even cost a thousand dollars that the timing belt replaced on one because it's the timing belt and two because it's all in one spot for both cams it's a dual cam engine this is a single over cam but it's still dual cam but at the end of the day it costs a lot more to do the actual job because of that one chain on the back if both chains are on the front it'd be an easy job you know wouldn't have to pull the engine at all pull the timing cover off swap them out you're done bolt it back up you're on the road but due to how their 4.0 was designed it's made it a lot more difficult especially on a part that is actually quite fam famous for failing on the 4.0 pretty early. I've seen some people get really unlucky and had it fail at 60,000 miles. I've had some people like me who get over 240,000 miles and not have any issues minus a little bit of noise at startup, which is obviously more of a tensioner issue than it is a cassette and chain issue. 
Sure, probably not great, but I mean, they still run perfectly fine to this day because obviously the tensioners are bleeding off and they get their oil pressure right back when they started anyway. So at the end of the day, it is a very big issue and it's a poor design choice because it really screws over the owners in the end because it's a product that fails often and then costs way too much to be fixed uh, due, to the, due to the fact that Ford designed it that way. Now, originally I thought maybe it was a balance thing. Maybe the 4.0 was too front heavy when they had both chains in the front. But my theory is that it was more of a thing just to kind of get you to come into the dealership to have it fixed. They really were just trying to make sure that when they failed, you came into a Ford dealership to get it fixed instead of trying to tackle it yourself. And that's what sucks. And at the end of the day, I mean, most people can get over it. I did. I mean, that's why I still drive mine to this day and don't complain about it very often. Um, sure, it's really obnoxious and really annoying and really stupid that they have that they designed it like that. But uh, at the end of the day, it still does the job just fine. It still drives like it should, even with the t chain issues and the bad gas mileage and, uh, you know, the low power. But again, these engines were really meant to be a powerhouse more than they were a torque monster for a V6 at the time. Uh, and obviously plenty of V6s have more torque now, but uh, in the early 2000s, this was not a bad engine to start with, especially because it was right behind the two valve in terms of power. Um, much like how the 3.7 is right behind the Coyote in power, uh, but not quite as close a gap because the two valve didn't make a lot of power to begin with. Sure, Ford could have done different things. If they really wanted to compete with the Avalanche, they could have thrown the Windsor in or the two valve at least. Um, obviously, we're going to go right away and point out that modulars don't really fit in Gen 1s, and that's because, again, the 95 to 01 chassis is the same one that's between the Windsor Fitzbride, but the modular family, like the two valve, three valve, and so on and so forth, don't fit uh, without extreme frame modifications. But that's kind of that on the 4.0's uh, timing chain issues, which is probably the biggest issue, and it's probably the biggest reason that people sell their Gen 1s or Gen 2 4, set for, or 4 liters. Um, because they just have issues with the timing chains because they cost so much to replace those just like, all right, I'll just all the and get a new truck, done. So that's the timing chains as a whole. The next thing, and it's probably the second biggest issue on a sport track, and it's probably one that pretty much everyone in the sport track community has dealt with at some point, and that is the thermostat housings. Now this is probably the biggest WTF moment that Ford could have done with the 4.0, and that is they put a plastic piece in somewhere where it gets really hot, and then really cold, and then really hot, and then really cold. So plastic, as you guys know, expands and contracts. And eventually, getting hot and cold so many times will cause it to crack and break. And then you lose all your coolant, risk overheating and blowing the motor up if you're not quick to catch it. So obviously, it's a very WTF moment because it's like, why would they put plastic around in an area that gets really hot and really cold very often, especially for those who drive their trucks every day like I do? But again, Ford was cutting corners. So the very common issue, very, very common issue, this one's on its fourth, because it was replaced once before I got it. I replaced it twice. And the fourth one is the one it's on right now. It had the factory one as well as the current one, which is why I say it's the fourth. Uh, which is why it's, uh, I finally pulled the trigger on a metal one. The third one was starting to leak and I was like, you know what, I'm not gonna let this burst and absolutely ruin my engine on a trip home from school, because I used to go an hour out for school. I take on mine now. And so I was like, you know, screw this. I'm just gonna go ahead and bite the bullet finally on the metal one. The metal ones that I got was $130, but it all works out in the end because now I don't have to worry about that. Even though my temps are a little bit higher as a result, uh, about 190, which is about what they should be really. But that's kind of that. The thermostat housing is a huge issue that a lot of people have dealt with. And you know, most people will just bite the bullet on a metal one from either Zantec or from eBay, like I got mine. Um, just to say, you know, give the plastic one the middle finger that Ford puts in these trucks because it's absolutely stupid. I don't know why Ford would do that. Um, pretty much anyone, the 4L, has probably dealt with this issue at some point. <laughs> Even Hayden, my, one of my closest friends who had a, a 4L Mustang, had to replace his own point too. So he was smart, unlike me, where I put several plastic ones in it before I finally put the metal one in. Uh, he went straight to the metal one. <laughs> but that, it's just a dumb design that Ford put on this engine. And it's probably one of the other bigger flaws of the 4L, even though it's a very simple fix. But besides that, there's one more issue I want to talk about. This one's actually not quite as common. Uh, it more pertains to the earlier Gen 1s, the 01 and 03s. Uh, and that is the crank pulley slash harmonic balancer tends to get a little wobbly towards the end. Um, now, this is very uncommon. Not a lot of people have this issue. I actually am one of the few that have the issue. Um, and it's a very easy fix. It's just swapping out the harmonic balancer and putting a new one on, um, which is not quite a big deal, really. Um, 
it's just annoying because uh, this is also an issue that, that plagues the LS2, but the LS2 I think is the worst because it can actually damage the crank. Um, if it goes too bad, I don't know if the 4 actually has that same issue. I would assume probably uh, if the bearing goes out too much, but that's kind of where that goes on that one. So it's fairly uncommon, but some people still have plenty of issues with it. I've seen tons, I've seen, now I wouldn't say tons of people, but I've seen plenty of people talk about it and I'm no different. Um, so that's all the flaws of the 4.0 itself. So not really a whole lot to really talk about. Um, obviously the manufacturing flaws are more what I'm focusing on here, not the kind of just uh, aging flaws like the power. Uh, I mean, sure, it's a four liter displacement engine. Most four liter displacement engines in the modern era are producing twice as much power. But this again is a 2003 truck. Most vehicles in 2003 horsepower, or didn't even have 200 horsepower unless they were a V8. <laughs> so that's kind of that on the 4.0 itself. The next big flaw mechanically is the transmission, which if you guys know, I've talked at ends about how bad the 5R is. Now, if you've got one of the M50D manual trucks, you're golden on that end at least. I'm jealous because I do wish I had that transmission sometimes. Um, the 5R is a glass cannon to say the least. It does its job pretty all right. I wouldn't say it gets terribly confused when you're trying to have fun with it, but it also isn't really the greatest for um, long-term reliability because they overheat and they blow out pretty often. Um, that's my theory is they suffer from really bad overheating issues and that's why they break uh, and wear out so often. It's just more they just get hot and they wear out because of that. The clutches get burnt up and then it just kills the transmission. Now obviously this could probably be remedied by putting an, oil, an a auxiliary oil cooler, probably you know upgrading the valve body and stuff like that, shift kits and stuff like that would probably help reduce that transmission temperature. So uh, if you guys have the money to spend on some of that stuff, kind of stuff, do it because that might help you keep your 5R running a little bit longer. But they are infamously unreliable, pretty much just as bad as a 4L60. So that's one thing to note is a very common issue that the 5Rs will grenade at some point. This one's also on its third transmission. Um, it was replaced It was replaced once when I got it, or right before I got it, and then it blew up on me, and then I had it replaced. So not a cheap job either. $2,500 to get that transmission replaced. But, uh, and that was before the solar would have been bad and it could take right back to the shop. But really besides that, it's really just a lot of just like little things like the cruise control switches tend to crack and fall apart very often. I mean, pretty much any Ford from the early 2000s had this issue. The Ranger, the Explorer, the Mustang. I mean, everything had that issue. They had the weak, soft plastic kind of buttons for the cruise control. Um, like the gauge clusters tend to go bad in the 04 to 05, so they tend to have tons of issues. Uh, I mean, the, the freaking armrest on the, on the back consoles, like mine was originally, because it's an XLS, break off a lot. I mean, it's just a lot of like little things. But uh, the main things I wanted to cover were all the mechanical faults. Um, so obviously stuff like wheel bearings, because if you're putting 35s on a truck, you should expect your wheel bearings to go out rather quickly compared to a stock setup. I'm one of the, mine probably would go bad a little bit quicker, even though I'm on a 20 inch wheel and pretty, uh, I wouldn't say narrow tires, thin tires, but I would say they're, they're a lot smaller than stock. Um, even that, I think, would probably wear out some wheel bearings. But at the end of the day, when you put aftermarket wheels in the car, that's just kind of something you have to um, come to terms with, is that it's probably going to wear out the bearings pretty quickly uh, compared to a stock wheel setup. But at the end of the day, that's kind of that. Uh, mainly just wanted to cover the main manufacturing faults, not as much the things that go bad with maintenance uh, over time. So if I missed anything, if, if I did, any sort of mechanical faults that Ford did themselves while producing the trucks, let me know in the comments what I missed. So obviously people are going to come at me and say that I'm going after Ford too much uh, and that Ford is just perfect. Uh, and that's just a brand loyalty thing. Most people do that with their brands. I know plenty of other people that say like Nissan's perfect, Toyota's perfect, Honda's perfect, Ford's perfect, Chevy's perfect, Dodge is perfect. Every company has its faults and every vehicle has faults. The Kia here on my side has been great. Maybe we'll give Kia crap and from the early mid 2000s. This car's been fantastic. We've really not had too many big issues out of it outside of, of like a couple power steering pump failures. The Equinox is notorious for having a really kind of fragile transmission, not quite as bad as the 5R, but still pretty bad. Uh, and then of course, all the ones I just named for my truck. So I mean, cars in general aren't perfect and that's something people have to get through right away is that there are gonna be flaws and regardless of your brand loyalty, so you think Ford is just this absolutely freaking godsend of a company, they are still gonna have their faults and these sport tracks are no different. At the end of the day, I still love mine. I still think they're fantastic trucks to buy. It's just, they got, you gotta be prepared to handle with some of the faults. And um, obviously cars themselves aren't gonna be perfect, regardless of who you buy from, whether it be a Ford, Chevy, Dodge, Nissan, Honda, Toyota, whatever. 
cars aren't going to be perfect. They're all going to have little faults here and there. Some cars are closer to perfection than others, but they're still going to have faults. And these are no different. So as long as you can get through that, that you you know, cars are your car's not going to be perfect regardless of what you buy, especially buy a used vehicle, then you'll be good to go. Um, but anyway, guys, hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to, be sure to leave a like, subscribe for more content coming soon on my full bolt-ons truck. Um, we're actually working behind the scenes on a new mod uh, as we speak. Um, and I should be ordering the parts to put together probably next week. So hope you all enjoyed. I'll see you guys on Friday with a brand new video. And uh, yeah, stay safe out there with all the crap that's going on in the world. And I'll see you guys then. Thank you